Okay, so now we're going to talk a bit about upper and lower sums and how they fit. We're going to move on to uh, at least trapezoidal rule because I saw that in the exam that we looked at. And I am going to stall for a second because I didn't find my pieces of paper. Um, Okay, so I've actually got the, the section of the lecture notes printed for this bit. So, the whole point about an upper sum or a lower sum or any of these things is it's to approximate the area of the um, area under a function. So, so it's a numerical approximation for an integral. Now, in actual fact, for particularly for finance, you, there is a lot of um, approximations done because we don't have an actual function for these things. All right. So, my wife's doing a finance degree, and actually, mostly she doesn't do anything like this. Mostly they're about um, probability distributions and knowing your annuities. And if you ask me, everything is in the annuity. But there is, it depends on which part of the finance you go in. If you go into a more quantitative form of finance, you might look at this sort of area, okay? So, we're going to start, we're actually going to start through with some basic ones, all right? With mathematics, you've got to put yourself into a situ in, into a mindset of, we're telling you about what happened, what, how these things developed over time. And so we started with what we call, um, started with uh, um, a situation where we didn't have calculators or whatever to, to do the calculation for us. We had to figure them out by hand. All the calculation was done by hand. And literally, one of the first um, computational things um, was this really it's beautifully made piece of device. But you turn the handle on. You literally turn the handle and watch things click. All right? So, um, and as they got more complicated, they put motors in them to turn the handle. Um, so they were really clever devices that did calculations for us, but they were just calculations. They had, they had nothing like the computational power that we have these days. Your phone has more power than... In fact, in a lot of cases, people's watches have more power than, than you know, computers even up into the, the even up into the mid '60s. All right, so and possibly beyond. I don't know enough about it to be confident. Um, so we've got unknown function, and I'm going to say, in terms of, uh, it is actually this sort of stuff is used quite heavily in sort of mining sort of areas, uh, where you actually do want to do that. Numerical techniques for finding integrals is actually a very common thing. So quite often we can get ourselves a graph of stuff. Um, and we want to know, so the reason we start with the upper sum and the lower sum is we want bounds. We want to know what's the best case and what's the worst case. So if you think you're trying to, you're, you've got a proposal, you want to look at the best case scenario and the worst case scenario so you know where you're going with it. So that's where we're going. I'm going to sort of... Approximating area. So one of the things we're going to do, so here you can see definition left be a function on the interval partitioned into n equal subintervals or each each of length this. And so you say, so you notice that we've got each subinterval, this is the i interval. This is my i interval. That didn't come out very well, but we're going to ignore that for the moment. And so when we're doing upper and lower sum, what we're doing is we're finding the minimum on that interval and the maximum on that interval. So if we look down here at their bits, so I'm going to, I'm just going to copy this bit, this example out. Actually, I'm going to see if I can pick, I'm going to see if I can find something from the exam where we've actually been asked to do that. Integrate. Uh, find the intersection, determine the area of the region bounded by the curve by 1 and y2. Yep. See if we can't find an actual question from somewhere. <laughs> Consider... All right. So 
So what we're going to do, <coughs> they've given us this So they're actually giving us this thing here from 4 to minus 4 of 16 minus x squared oops, dx. So they've said calculate upper sum using four intervals. So Okay, so first thing I'm going to do is draw a little picture of this. And this is actually almost a, I actually recommend drawing yourself a really simple sketch of the, fun, of the function you're dealing with. Now, the idea of talking about to you about a whole lot of functions, all right, so a whole lot of your schooling stuff was telling you about functions. And so in this case, this thing looks like this, all right? So you've got minus four here, you've got zero here, you've got four here. And this value here is actually 4 as well. So, <clears throat> if I'm going to break this interval into four equal parts, I'm going to have my 4 here, uh, I'm going to have 2 and minus 2 and 2. So you can see I've broken my interval into this. So what we're actually doing is we're going to, we go through this thing where I go, well, my integral, integral is from A to B of f of x. So a is equal to, in our case, minus 4. b is equal to 4. n is equal to 4. There is a lot of 4s in this question. You'd think the lecture is like the number was 4. So delta x, b minus a on n, which is equal to 4 minus minus 4 on 4 is actually going to be equal to 2. So the width of each of these intervals is 2. All right. So if I try and just with this first one, clearly the maximum value is up here. And so to work out that area, I need to work out the function height at that point, and I need to times it by 2. What I'm actually going to do is I'm going to, this is my point A which I'm going to say is equal to x0. So this one here is going to be equal to x1, this is x2, this is x3, and this is x4, and x4 is equal to b. All right, so if I go through and label all of my points, yeah? So, this is giving me an idea of where I'm going, all right? And this is, this is actually fairly typical of an exam type of question for this, all right? We're either going to get you to do this, or I'll show you what the other option is in a second. All right? There's the, I've got a specific number of intervals, and you'll notice what's happened is my function turns around in the middle. Okay? So um, I'm going to look at your lecture notes and make sure I don't tell you something you don't need to know, but we'll go back to that in a second. So this stuff here, this is telling me what A is, telling me what B is, telling me what N is, telling me what delta X is, and I even go to the trouble of going XI, is always a plus i times delta x. So in this case, it's going to be minus 4 plus i times 2. All right. And so you can see x1 is minus 4 plus 2, x2 is minus 4 plus 4, x3 minus 4 plus 6, x4 is minus 4 plus 8. All worked out. It's all nice and simple and straightforward. So my maximums. Maximum 1 is going to be equal to f of minus 2, which is going to be 16 minus, minus 2 squared. Oops. That's right. Good. I may have made a mistake with that bit. That might be 16. Shh. There we go. 16 minus 4, which is going to be 12. 12! Sweet. So we're going to work out M2. Now, M2, pretty clearly we can observe that it's going to be here. Yes? Where did you get the minus 2? Where did I get the minus 2? So, because I'm looking at this interval for that M1, so it's the maximum on that first interval, I look at this and I just observe 
that the maximum value occurs at that right, at that right hand endpoint. Okay? So typically if I have a function which is always increasing or always decreasing, I can make a general rule that it's this. Because this goes starts increasing and then finishes decreasing, I need to do something slightly different. Okay? So I, I have to work out each individual one. Um, there is some symmetry, symmetry in this equation which is going to make my life easier. But f of 0 is going to be 16 minus 0 squared is equal to 16. And m3 f of 2, f of, this is actually going to be f of 0 again, all right? Because if I, so this is interval 1, i1, i2, i3. So you can see that this is the maximum value there, but it's also the maximum value here because it's the maximum of the function, all right? There is, um, so usually they'll keep it reasonably simple, but you should always do a bit of a check. Is, have I found the maximum? And does it occur inside an interval, or is it at the joining points, all right? Because they want you to demonstrate you understand, they don't want to, they're not actually really trying to trick you up. They will do things which says, I do understand that I need to check, but they won't do stuff to actually mislead you. All right, so you just have to be a bit careful. And so again, we can see that M4 is just going to be F of 2. So we're just looking at our diagram to just work out those values, which is going to be equal to 16 minus 2 squared, which is equal to 12 again. And so my upper sum on four intervals, so the number here is the number of intervals that we're using, is going to be, so delta x times m1 plus delta x times m2 plus delta x times m3 plus delta x times m4. So my rule of thumb says that if there is, if there's less than about six numbers, what you're really supposed to do is write it out, add it up. If there's less than about 12 numbers, you still have the option to write it out and add it up. 12, somewhere at 10, 12 is where you go, I could just write these numbers out and add them up and that might work out. It might be quicker than trying to look for the trick. Anything over six, there's probably a trick that you could use to make it simpler. So somewhere between sort of six and 12 is where you go, there might be a trick, but it might not be making my life easier. I might just be quicker calculating these things. So let's fill in the numbers. This is 2 times 12 plus 2 times 16 plus 2 times 16 plus 2 times 12. Who knows? 24 plus 32 plus 32 plus 24, 56, All right, this is where I re repeat my caveat. I may get the numbers wrong, but the idea is right. Okay, if I'm working things out in the lecture, I often make a mistake. So, <clears throat> so that's doing the just the upper sum, all right? And the lower sum works in a very similar way, okay? Just having a bit of a scan over this question, I could tell you that the lower sum for this one is going to be 48. And so you see there's a big difference between the 112 and the 48, but one is a lower bound and one is an upper bound, and n is equal to 4 is a relatively small number of intervals for this type of thing. Okay? Now I'm going to come back to this in a, um, in, in a second, because the, the, uh, the next part of that question from the exam was um, how many uh, do the trapezoidal rule. Okay? But what I want to do is I want to look at the sort of things your lecturer was talking about. So the lecturer was doing calculate the upper, uh, upper and lower sum for the example. So I don't know the example, I'm not going to worry about it. But they're doing a very similar sort of thing in their examples. All right? So their example mirrored what you did in the exam quite closely, what you were asked to do in the exam quite closely. Now, this bit here. So this is... Um, when we're talking about, in some, uh, some simpler cases, partition of the thing into n equal parts of each length, this, da, 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 we can write down the upper and lower sum. So in this case, right, what we're talking about is a situation where my function is either increasing or decreasing. So um, we might be able to, we might be able to sort of find another I'm going to look at the other 
the other exam that I have here. So I brought two exams um, to see if they had to see if we had examples to work from. And I've got an example of another upper and lower something that I can do easily. I might just, if they've got, I'm sort of looking to see if they've actually asked different types of questions. Um, so that I can make sure that if you're supposed to be able to do a particular thing. Okay, that one didn't actually ask enough for a lower sum question. Um, okay. So what we're going to do, so when we start talking about this sort of thing, I'm going to draw it on this page, uh, no, I'm going to do it on this. So when I start talking about n, n intervals, like an arbitrary number of intervals, um, I, I need to sort of, I need to do things in a general sense. So, so if I have a simple function, y is equal to 4x plus 1, all right? And so I'm going to do the integral from 1 to 3 of 4x plus 1 with respect to x. So just quickly, my sketch of this function looks something like this, where this is 1 and this is 3. And so I can see my function is de increasing. So, so I'm not sure that you actually went this far, but the lecture notes said that you've done this sort of thing. So I'm going to go through this on the off chance that, that, that this is something you might see in the exam, right? Because it's quite a common thing to see in the exam. So. We're breaking it into n intervals. So again, we're going to go a is equal to 1, b is equal to 3. In this case, my delta x. Delta x is going to be equal to b minus a on n, which is 3 minus 1 on n, which is 2 on n. I can't write it any simpler than that. I don't know an n. In actual fact, I'm deliberately not going to know the n at all for this question. Okay? I'm not going to have this... And this is, sort of, this is sort of the level of complexity that I would expect in your exam if you're going to see something like this, okay? So, I've got my delta x. And so my xi is equal to a plus i times delta x, which in this case is going to be 1 plus 2i on n. Okay? So, all good? Yes? No advice, I'd say yes. So, um, because we've observed my function is increasing, I can observe that that means that the maximums occur at the right hand endpoint of the function, all right, of each of those intervals. So what we've done is we've broken this up into lots and lots of little intervals. And so somewhere in here we have the ith one, okay? And so the maximum here occurs here. Now this ith interval starts with xi minus one and goes up to xi. So that means we've got the function evaluated at xi is my maximum. So we've got this expression for xi, and so this is going to be 4 times by this thing, 1 plus 2i on n, uh, plus 1. And so I can expand this out and simplify it. All right? I'm getting myself 4 plus 8i on n, plus 1, which we'll write as 5 plus 8i on n. That's my maximum value. So this is equal to the maximum on the ith interval. Okay? Loving that so far? So, 
when I come to do my upper sum, my upper sum on n intervals, so again, n, the n here is telling me the number of intervals I'm using, is going to be the sum of delta x times my maximums, starting from i is equal to 1 to n. So my sum is from the first interval to the last interval of this thing here. I always put the delta x outside, all right? Less I have inside my sum, because basically I can factorize that thing, I put it outside, and then this bit inside here, my mi, 5 plus 8i on n. Okay, so I've got myself my delta x is 2 on n, and this thing here is sum. i is equal to, uh, n is equal to i. i is equal to 1, 2 n of 5 plus 8i on n. So this is where I start using my, my knowledge of summations. So we've all seen the summation stuff that you did. So part of, pretty much the reason you did the summation, all right, two main reasons. One, to do this. Two is because it crops up a whole lot of other places and you need to be familiar with summation notation. All right, need to be familiar with it and comfortable with it. And so one of my, if you talk to some of the people who come to the mass drop-in centre regularly, you'll hear, you'll go, yeah, Nick says, write them out, add them up. And this is when you're faced with a summation and you're not sure what to do, write out the first couple of terms, see what it's doing. All right? And sometimes that whole rule of thumb, if there's not too many terms, I can just write them out, I can add them up. In this case here, I'm going to use my rules of summation to break this up. All right? So because this is sum of something plus something, I can write it as the sum i is equal to 1 to n of that first thing, plus sum i is equal to 1 to n of that second thing. Okay, and so my next trick, 2 on n. So, if I know the thing inside it is a constant, I'm adding it up n times. And so I can go, well, that's just 5 times n. With this other one, I know that this is, this, my 8 divided by n is just a constant value for every possible value of i. It doesn't change with i. And so I can take it outside the summation. Same as I did here, I took the delta x outside, and here I can take the 8 on n. So I can take my 8 on n, and I've got my sum, i is equal to 1 to n of i. Yes? So far, so good? Now, so I'm going to have myself 2 on n, 5n, plus 8 on n. Now, do we know what the sum of i is from i is equal to 1 to n? Let's go with, all right, n, n plus 1, all divided by 2. And since I'm doing this, I've got it written out nicely here, I'm going to cancel that one out. Okay? And now, we've got rid of all the i's. This thing is solely in terms of n. n is the thing we don't know, so I'm going to do as much simplification as I can, but hopefully, I'm going to get down to 2 on n times by 5n plus 2 on n times by 8 times by n plus 1 on 2. That 2 is going to cancel. Hey, that n can cancel. Sweet. Check this out. So this is going to get me 10 plus 8n plus 8 on n, which I can write as 10 plus 8 plus 8 on n, and just in at the bottom, 18 plus 8 on n. All right, now, I've got n in my formula. Is that a problem? No, because we don't know the number of intervals. All right, so, possibly what I'm going to do, so, this is like a general formula. So I've actually got a formula for the upper sum, which is dependent on the number of intervals. All right? I can do exactly the same thing for my lower sum. All right? There are two ways to do that. So I'm just, I'm actually going to try and do, I'm actually going to run through this, this second one a lot quicker. But I'm just going to write it out. So my lower sum on n intervals, my minimums are equal to f of xi minus 1. So I put the minus 1 in here. 
and so that's going to be four times uh, four times one plus two, and then i minus one. So the i minus the oh, i minus one goes there uh, on n plus one. So I'm getting five plus two i minus one on n. Uh, whoops, that should be an eight. And so my lower sum on n intervals. So formula delta x summation i is equal to one to n of uh, f of x i minus one. So two on n summation i is equal to one to n of five plus eight i minus one on n. Now, pause momentarily. So we're, this does this looks fairly similar to what we saw for the upper sum, and it should look fairly similar to what we saw for the upper sum. All right. So what we said is that the that that minimum value on that interval was at the left hand endpoint. So maximum was at the right hand because we had an increasing. So that means the minimum must be at that right hand endpoint. And so I'm going to do a little trick where I shift the index here. Alright? So if I make it, so if I imagine the first when I put in i is equal to one, I get this number becomes zero. i is equal to two, this is one, i is equal to three, this is two. And the last number I'm going to get is when i is when i, I is equal to n, which is going to be n minus one. So I can write this as 2 on n summation i is equal to 0 to n minus 1, all right, and then 5 plus 8i on n. So you see how it's written almost exactly like the previous one. So that shift of index allows me to go write it almost exactly. The only real difference is this thing here. So if I go through that same process, 2 on n summation of 5 i is equal to 0 to n minus 1 plus I'm going to put the 8 on n straight out the front with this one i i is equal to 0 to n minus 1 is equal to 2 on n this bit's going to be 5 times n plus 8 on n sum from i is equal to 0 to i n minus 1 it's a trick if the first number I'm adding is 0 so, so we're going to, just over here is a bit of an aside. Sum i is equal to 0 to n minus 1 of i is equal to sum i is equal to 1 to n minus 1 of i. Okay? It's, this, this is saying that first number is 0. All right? We're going 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus all the way up to n, uh, n minus 1. But that's equal to sort of 1 plus 2 plus all the way up to n minus 1. All right? We didn't change, we didn't actually change the result of the sum because we just said, well, we're not including 0. And that means it fits the form for doing my formula. And so this should be n minus 1, that number, n minus 1 plus 1, which is going to be n on 2. Again, on 2. Again, we can cancel it there to make it simpler. So I'm getting. 10 n on n plus 8 n minus 8 times by 2 on on n. Oh no, did that. Uh, on 2, and so this cancels, and so I'm left with 10 plus 8 minus 8 on n. That's not on the screen, is it? Sorry about that. And so this is going to be 18 minus 8 on n. And so you can see that my lower sum on n intervals looks almost exactly like, I'm going to overlay this, almost exactly like my upper sum on n intervals. So we've got this 18. This bit here, if I take n, the number of intervals towards infinity, this term here goes to zero. Same with this term here. And so my upper sum and my lower sum go to the same number, and that's going to be 18. All right? And so this area we can say is going to be 18, just because my upper sum and my lower sum go to the same number. Okay? So this is, this is not out of the realms of possibility for a question they will ask in the exam. Okay? So, and that's where, that's what you're that's exactly what they're expecting you to do. Um, taking a bit longer than I expected. 
So this is all of what they're talking about here. They're talking about the summation notation and the rules of summation notation here. Mm -hmm. Don't know where I put it. Uh, so here, so this stuff they expect you to know for the exam. All right. So the sum of that one, sum of a constant value, is just n times that constant value. Sum of in sequential numbers starting from one and ending at some value n is just n by n plus 1 divided by 2. Um, they also expect you to know this thing here. Where, so you saw me use these things in the, in the working there, where I sort of took this, uh, I've got a sum of something plus something, and I split it into the sum. Of, if, you'd wrote, if you write these things out, you can see how they break up. So it's just like if I wrote out the sum, I can see those things breaking up. And the same with if I have a constant times the value, I can bring the constant out on the side. And so you saw me do all of those things. Uh, so this is doing pretty much the same sort of example. So this some inter function, the velocity of a moving body at time t seconds, the distance travelled. Okay, whatever. No. So that's just doing some interpretation. Um, I am trying. To so. Pausing momentarily to highlight this particular piece of information. The lower sum is always less than or equal to the integral, and the upper sum is always greater than or equal to the integral. And that is the point about the upper sum and the lower sum. They are bounds. All right? They are the worst case and best case scenario for each of these things. Okay? Um, they did. Pause while I swear a little bit and go, ooh. Okay. So, I'm going to go back to my question here. I actually don't see. Yeah, do you guys, did you guys do trapezoidal rule? Yeah. You did do trapezoidal rule. Okay, good. I've just gone. I don't see it in the notes there. I skipped over that and I'm like, hmm. Because what I was looking for is actually where they've given the formula. Now, I might have missed it because I, you know, get stressed standing up in front of people and talking a lot. Um, but um, it might be that you know they, it's in a different section. Um, so trapezoidal rule is nice and simple. So we saw before. Going to draw me a picture. Going to draw me a picture. All right. So we saw this. We've got some function doing this, right? And we've broken it into several intervals. Okay. Now, with my upper sum and my lower sum. My lower sum was taking these low, lower rectangles and my upper sum was taking these upper ones. Okay? Now my trapezoidal rule is going to do a trick. Alright? Where what it's going to do is it's going to treat this as a straight line. And just from the picture you can see it's going to give a much better expl explanation of what's going on. Unless there's a sharp change in the way the function goes we're not actually, we're going to get a much better approximation for what the area is going to be, aren't we? Okay? So, area of a trapezoid. So if I have trapezoid parallel sides here, so this is like A, this is B, and this is C, and so the area of this thing here, I can break it into a rectangle. This thing here is going to have area A times B. And this area is going to be a half times A, so a half times the base. That height, this height here, is actually going to be um, C minus B. Okay, so I've got A, B plus a half. A C minus a, a half A B. So this is getting me a half, a half A C. A B minus a half A B is going to get me plus a half A B, which I'm going to go half of A times B plus C. Or, in actual fact, usually the way it's written is uh, A times 
B plus C on two. The average of B plus C. Kind of going, okay, yes, that's how's that working for me. So we're going to stick with a function that's increasing. All right, so we've got F and we're going to have it increasing. Now, the good thing about this formula is with my upper sum and my lower sum, I have to have the maximum or the minimum. For this one, we, we don't need to have the maximum or minimum. We're going this endpoint, we're actually using the endpoints of the interval. All right? There are, there are some other, so these things fall under the heading of what they call Riemann sums. And so this is a specific type of Riemann sum. All right? My upper sum is a special, upper sum and lower case are special cases. So what we're going to do is we're going to do, if we look at this thing here, our, our area, actually we're going to go trapezoidal rule using n intervals. So it's going to be the interval width. So the same interval width, same interval, the interval width is my a, and my, so I'm going to have f of x0 plus f of x1 divided by 2 plus delta x and then f of x1 plus f of x2 all divided by 2 plus lots of stuff. So I can, in trying to express this in a summation notation, delta x sum i is equal to 1 to n. This is f of x i minus 1 minus uh, plus f of x i on 2. So again, I'm dividing something by 2. If I look at what's happening, if I actually look at what's happening here, that first one, you see how I've got x naught just once, but then I look, I've got f of x1 twice, and if I go through, I'm going to have all of those. So what we quite often do is we go delta x times a half times uh, sort of f naught, f of x naught plus 2 by f of x1 plus 2 by f of x2 plus f of xn minus 1. So we're going to get two of that one, but I'm only going to get f of x n once. Okay? So this is my sum. Yes? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Back in my day, back when I started, you wrote on the blackboard and it was chalk. Yeah. Didn't fit on the blackboard? No. Um, so, so we can see that we've got these n values here just once, but these intermediate values occur twice. All right, the inter internal ones occur twice. The thing I'm noticing about this, right? So, I would have need to. Have, this is where I go. Ooh, damn. Quite often, we sometimes see this written as a half of left-hand endpoint plus right-hand endpoint approximation. So, So did we do the left endpoint sum and the right endpoint sum? So if my function is increasing, the left end is the lower sum and the right end is the upper sum. And these are, these are sort of going, they are easy things to calculate. And this trapezoidal rule is just the, appro is just the um, approximation for it. So what I'm going to do got my thing. So we're going to actually go back to the exam question and talk about that one. Alright, my exam question, unfortunately it didn't print correctly, but that's okay. Um, we had integral from minus 4 to 4 of 16 minus x squared dx. Now, if I've done, done the trapezoidal rule with my straight line function, 
I would have got an exact value. That's one of the beauties of the trapezoidal rule. If it's a if it's a if it's a straight line function, you're going to get the exact value. So, but so my same thing. Delta x is equal to uh, I'm just going to use the thing from before. Two on n. My x i is equal to minus four plus uh, sorry two 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 i. Um, so we had um, f of minus four is equal to zero. F of minus two was equal to 12. F of zero is equal to 16. F of two is equal to 12. And F of four is equal to zero. So these are my, my function values. My trapezoidal rule with four intervals is going to be a half. So the half is just saying I'm actually averaging two uh, approximations, my left hand point and my right hand point. And then I'm going to go f naught. So f naught plus plus two times f of minus two plus two times f of zero plus two times f of two plus f of zero. So all these middle ones we get twice. Uh, that's going to be a four. My apologies. And so I get my half. I fill in my numbers. Zero plus two times twelve plus 2 times 32 plus 2 times 12 plus 0 is equal to a half of 24 plus 60, 64. Did I stuff that up? Yes, I did. That said 16. <sighs> See, you've got to watch me. Make mistakes all over the place. That should be 32 plus 24 which is going to be a half of 48 plus 32, which is 80. Half of 80 is equal to 40. <laughs> what did I do wrong? Times <laughs> x. So I got, what, what did I do? Didn't put in my delta x. So I didn't times by delta x times by delta x and so this thing here should have a 2 in there okay so my trapezoidal rule on four intervals gave me an answer of 80 my upper sum on four intervals gave me an answer of 112 and my lower sum whoops that will make it a whole lot easier on four intervals gave me a value of Oh, maybe I don't have a lower sum. Uh, lower sum is going to give me a value of 20, uh, 12, 12, 24, times by 2, it's going to be 48. Lower sum is going to give me 48. So if I was to average these, it, literally if I average these two, I'm going to get 80. I knew that. All right. And so the trapezoidal rule is, is giving me a, a better approximation for the actual value. But the thing it's losing is that it is no longer a, either an upper bound or a lower bound. It is just an approximation for the interval, in, for the area. Okay? Do you guys have any questions? No? Maybe? All right, sweet. Okay. Um, don't really have a plan for this, do I? Okay. So, uh, so nothing in particular you want me to talk about at all. All right. Well, if you're all good, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start.